On behalf of Millet Army, hello and welcome to the Council of the Americas, Javier Millet Translated Speech. For those of you not familiar with Javier Millet, he is an Argentine economist, libertarian, and is currently the front-runner presidential candidate according to the preliminary elections recently held in Argentina, which he led with 35% of the vote. After Javier Millet, we will listen to his vice presidential pick, Victoria Villarroel. Thank you very much to everyone who is here for sharing this moment. Thank you, Susan, for the invitation. The first thing I want to say is, today we know that a better Argentina is possible. That Argentina that is liberal, vigorous, and progresses is possible because Argentina has awoken to the ideas of liberty. In that sense, the presentation will have three lines. One about the diagnosis of the decay in Argentina. Second, what has to do with our thinking of how to get out of this. And the last part, talk about some things that we feel have to be done and which we will effectively do. If on October 22nd, more Argentinians join this project of Liberty Advances, that's the only serious project to turn 180 degrees and bring Argentina to its feet to begin the reconstruction. In respects to what the origin of the decay of Argentina has to do with us, we have systematically defined as the model of the oligarchs. The oligarchs model dictates that where there is a need, a right is born. Now the problem created is that the needs are infinite. And if there is a right, someone has to pay for it. And if somebody has to pay for it, let me tell you that resources are not infinite. And infinite needs without infinite resources and there we have a conflict. That conflict, the liberals, we have very clear how we can resolve with private property and a pricing system and without government interference. Now, this solution may not be the one that politicians in general may like. In general, they prefer the tight grip of the government instead of the invisible hand. And in that sense, the solution that they propose and the instrument that they use falls under the label of social justice, a concept that is simply not right unless you're in favor of unequal treatment before the law and theft, because that's what social justice is. It's stealing from one person to give it to somebody else, and unequal treatment before the law, something truly horrible, that in addition have consequences over the decay of moral values and the behavior of individuals to such a point that it changes a society into a society of looters. That scheme of politics based on social justice, the consequences are translated into fiscal deficit. Not a minor subject because from the beginning of the 20th century to present 122 years, 112 have been with deficit. Furthermore, if we continue with the Sarah Maloney method, Argentina, since the 20th century to present has had 22 crises, 20 of which were caused by high or extravagantly high fiscal deficit. 
and that also has consequences over the macrodynamic economics. In general, what the politicians usually do is take on debt first, something deeply immoral which indicates that today's party, because they are obligating future generations to pay because the debt are future taxes to be paid. And those taxes on the future are going to fall on our children, on their children, on people that have not been born yet, that can't even defend themselves with a vote. Furthermore, the indebtedness is strongly in moral politics, politics that are embraced by the rude socialists and the good-mannered socialists, because they too have been complices voting budgets with deficit. In that sense, on the other side, when the financing is over, Argentina enters default. Argentina is the worst serial defaulter in history. Obviously, at some point when this happens, the politicians, instead of cutting spending and organizing the books, they fall back on the money printing machine. In other words, they end up generating inflation. Moreover, the scam the central bank implicates, moreover, the scam it implicates to just print more money. The problem in discoordination in the macroeconomics is enormous, not only because of the impact it has on prices, generating distortions that scare away investors, and in addition, cause them in places where they're usually not found. And as a result, it causes enormous damage, also causing redistributable effects on the most vulnerable. It also generates a society that ends up confronted between those that can escape the imposed inflation and those that cannot. Situations which politicians use to provoke society in search of political gain. And on the other hand, let's not even talk of the historical inflation in Argentina before the central bank, which is from 1935. Before that, we didn't have a central bank. And Argentina was the wealthiest nation in the world in 1895 with no central bank. Just some small details for those mental slaves that can't escape old structures that only serve thieving politicians, that are accomplices with the thieving politicians, because in the last 20 years, with the seniorage, the Argentinians of good were robbed of $280 billion. And this actual government, or non-government, or whatever you want to call it, is surpassing the $90 billion. If you take it in annual terms, politicians through seniorage rob us of $25 billion. I would like to know, you that are the private sector that generates riches, why do you allow a theft of $25 billion a year at the hand of a group of thieves? Because to me, those delinquents should be in prison. And when there is no more to do, then they fall back on raising taxes. And then, by the way, Argentina today has close to 170 taxes. And 160 of those taxes only generate one point of the GDP. They're called kiosks. And when they say it can't be changed, what they're saying is that they are defending the kiosks of 160 delinquents against all the Argentinians of good, especially those that create riches. Naturally, this model that is only useful to the oligarchs, where not only are the oligarchs are the thieving politicians, 
it is also composed of prebendary businessmen, those that like to do business with the government, that like to have the cow tied. It is also composed of syndicates that give up their workers instead of representing them. And it is also composed of the purchased microphones and the professionals and alluding to certain level, theoretical and sophisticated, their operators of the power, calling themselves economists that defend these atrocities by the politicians, those that say you can't adjust. And how were the accounts before the Kirchnerismo got to Argentina? What they're saying when they can't adjust, they are defending the atrocities committed by the Kirchneristas for 16 years. Come on. At least hide it a little bit that you're Kirchneristas with good manners and that you love public spending because from there you steal. So then, that is the model of the oligarchs. The good and bad-mannered, a model that only makes us to be the biggest slum of the earth. Because we started the 20th century as the richest nation in the world. Today, at a parallel exchange rate, we're at number 140. 45% of poverty, and the most painful, in the country where we produce food for 420 million human beings, with fiscal pressure of 70% on farms, the government takes the food of 240 million people and there are 5 million Argentinians that are starving. So come explain to me how this is solved with government presence when all it's done has sunk us in this misery. In that sense, we propose true change, a real change, a true change. We have come to give a change of 180 degrees, which in three generations adds up to 540, and everyone knows what it means. I send greetings. In that sense, what we propose is a model of liberty. The model of liberty is based on and synthesized brilliantly by the maximum exposer of our ideas in all time, even more than Alberti, who is Alberto Venegas Lynch, hijo. And we have the privilege of one of his sons, Berti, be our first representative for the province of Buenos Aires. When did we in the camera imagine have such a luxury of legislators like we are presenting. Besides that, the reference is that define liberalism as the unrestrained respect for the life project of others based on the principle of non-aggression and in defense of the right to life, liberty, and private property. Its institutions are private property, markets free of government interference, the competition understood as free entrance and exit, the division of work and social cooperation, and only where it is possible to succeed, serving others with better goods at better prices. In other words, those who do well in the capitalism of free enterprise are heroes. In other words, those who create riches, they are rewarded by the market because they solve the lives for people. They make lives better for everybody. Something that looks like some places of Argentina, they don't understand. There's a phrase by Milton Friedman that says, 
Speaking of the responsibility of businessmen, Milton Friedman said, making money. Because if you're making money, that means you're serving others with better goods at better prices, and you're making people's lives easier. Those entrepreneurs that do well, they are heroes. They're social benefactors. That's you. You are the ones that have to put Argentina on its feet. I promise to get the government off of you. In that sense, what's more? What are the results of the model that we propose? Look, those countries that have more freedom are eight times wealthier than those that are oppressed. Not only that, but also the lowest decile on the distribution is 11 times better than their counterpart in oppressed countries. What's more, given the format of income distribution, be it an H-squared format, otherwise known as Pareto distribution, where the medium income is below the medium, those are in the lowest decile of the free country, are better than 90% of the people of the oppressed country. Not only that, there are 25% less poor in the standard format and 50% less in the extreme format. What's more, people live 25% longer. So why be so scared of the ideas of liberty? Look, because of the mere question of stochastic dominance, we are the only true and valid option. They can keep the oligarchs model with the oligarchs of good or bad manners. And that is, you're going to end up poor, miserable, in ruins, at least in stochastic terms, we're much better. But with this being said, which is the implementation? And what we're proposing there is three groups of reforms three generations of reforms. And this is a program thought in a lapse of 35 to 50 years to complete. And this means also, and as a project, it exceeds largely my political career. That's why together with Victoria, we always emphasize, thank you for being here. We always emphasize in determining the new foundations of the new Argentina. We understand it's a long journey, that in many aspects we, we are going to be planting the seeds of a tree whose shade we will never enjoy. But someone has to do it. And that's why we have presented this long-term vision, determining institutional parameters under which we should move to replicate this miracle. Because, by the way, we've already done this. We did it in 1860, when Buenos Aires was annexed. We started using Alberdi's constitution, and from being a barbaric country, we rose to number one in 35 years. Additionally, anywhere where the model is applied, it works. The problem today stems from the solution is in the hands of the problem. At least that's what was thought before these preliminary elections. In that sense, It has to be clear that a new Argentina is impossible with the same people as always. It has to be clear that we can't change the results if we are always doing the same things. It has to be clear that if it's all or nothing, 
when the law of rents is proposed, we move to derogate. Not for a little bit less control, we move to derogate. The right to private property is respected for real, not just cosmetically to look good. In that sense, what we consider is, given the circumstances, political and of the system, I'm going to make the focus on what we call first-generation reforms. And I would say that there are four fundamental bases on this. The first is government reform. The government reform in the beginning, we're talking about lowering expenses, lowering taxes, and eliminate regulation. In that sense, the first element of the reform of government is reforming the law of ministries. And we are only going to keep eight ministries. The Economics Ministry, the Department of Foreign Affairs Ministry, Infrastructure, Justice, Defense, and Ministry of the Interior. In this sense, I would like to clarify that there is a revolutionary aspect to our program that has to do with the Ministry of Human Capital. When you see the evidence throughout humankind's history, the large growth rate that the world has starts in the 19th century. In the 19th century, the fundamental reasons for growth were directly attributed to the improvements in health, while in the 20th century, it was education and apprenticeship. 70 points of growth are explained directly by human capital. In the meantime, those that argue they want to make Argentina better, I invite you to debate me on human capital, or you just uh, repeat phrases that other people say. In that sense, our Ministry of Human Capital will be occupied with children and families. It's going to deal with health and education and the integration to work. We are going to change the way we look at social politics bringing to an end the culture of giving things away for free, giving the fish away. We're going to form free individuals so that they can live from the fruit of their work and teach them how to fish. Over is this model of enslavement where the most vulnerable sectors are taken to precarious situations where they can be enslaved. The slavery is over in Argentina, obviously modern slavery, which means we are going to finish with those forms of dependency. At the same time, we propose a drastic decrease in public spending. And obviously, what are the oligarchs going to tell you about public spending, which is what they live from? You can't touch that. That's an exaggeration. Of course it's an exaggeration, because they eat from there. So we are willing to finish with, for example, public works. We're not saying that infrastructure work will not be done. There will be, but it will be in a system like in Chile, where it's a private initiative. It's very interesting, because years before it was shown, I obviously couldn't retweet that video because of election rules. It was a person on a highway in Chile, and suddenly he crosses to Argentina. And then you could see the highway that he had on Chile with the private and the difference with Argentina, which was government. 
So you could do it another way. Another way that Bastiak said would avoid the porous hands of the politicians. Obviously, a politician will tell you that that is impossible. Obviously, imagine how much they stop collecting. Also, we have to eliminate the discretional transfers. That's a case of once for always. And what has to do with what some economists would call liquefaction and has to do with the extraordinary resources generated beyond the budget as a consequence of accelerated inflation. That also allows for a very strong adjustment, and that's an adjustment that most hurts the politicians, because those transfers are done from the executive power to the provinces, especially to the provinces with questionable accounting. You can imagine why. Another thing we propose is the elimination of economic subsidies. What we propose is a recalibration of the economic equations in the contracts. For those who have formation in finances, and obviously my competitors can't say this because they can't even calculate an actual net value. Look, the truth is not hard, it just is. You can't ask the oak tree for pears. So, in that sense, what this is implicating is the beat of the firm's cash flow will never be below the whack. Quite a condition to protect the foundation of capital so one can make projects to the future in conditions of judicial security and confidence to make investments, which in addition, in the contracts, we're going to add these clauses. Because the difference of the process of taking it to the Siadi, it's a very long process that destroys a lot of value. By being a part of the actual contracts, that makes it much more executable. Like in the example of Mexico, it was very successful. In other words, private property will be respected at all costs. And obviously, we're going to move forward on the privatization of public companies. And we're going to try to end, within the legal limits, the privileges that the politicians have in terms of privileged retirements. What that's going to assure us not only reach a financial equilibrium, in other words, a true fiscal deficit of zero in the financial line. It also is going to provide additional income, which will allow us to begin the fiscal reform and start the tax system simplification. Our objective is an agreement with the provinces to take it to 10 taxes and also to be lower in cost. What's more, what it has to do with, this is an important point with the recalibration of the financial equations in the contracts. One of the things that we propose and we're going to extend throughout the whole economy is the elimination of taxes on profits that are reinvested without additionally charging taxes on capital that is generated from the sale of the business. That way we don't have to build fiscal structures so that we can take out the money in the form of interest, which are hidden dividends. In other words, we're going to put a cannon of enormous cash flow to the companies. For what? So that they can invest and keep investing. And when you invest, not only productivity goes up, employment goes up, the wages go up and everybody does better. We have to understand that that dispute that they try to plant from some sectors that portray business and businessmen as the enemy to the workers, that is an error. That is a process of social cooperation. If businesses do well, 
the workforce is doing well and Argentinians of good are doing well. The only ones that will not be doing well under my model will be the thieving politicians that made this country the hell it is and walks the ruins that it walks. And that's why it's impossible to have a different Argentina with the same ones as always. The ones that have privileges. Those that have never set foot in the private sector and have spent their whole life being government parasites. And that it's clear that I have a relative advantage. But it's not only the reform in terms of lowering costs and lowering taxes. We're also advancing in an ambitious reduction in regulations. So then, Argentina has close to 70,000 regulations. Okay, we need to start lowering regulations, which makes it impossible to do business in Argentina. In another part, in parallel, we propose a modernization of the labor market. We are trying to leave this caveman system that we have now from using the laws, the regulations, and the government as a form of security. If I need insurance, I go and buy insurance. I'm going to put it into easier terms to see if I can make it easier to understand what I want to say. Let's say I'm a person that's greatly adverse to risk. And I'm very scared when I'm on the streets of crashing. In that situation, I am going to get insurance. Well, that insurance, how do I get it? Uh, I contract an insurance. I can put on two seatbelts. I could put dual airbags. I could put the system that drops the engine when you crash. I could make it bulletproof. I could put a chassis on it that would keep it running even if it gets crashed. The question is, if I do that, who do I harm? The answer is no one, because how do I fix the problem? With my own pocket. Okay then, we can do this the caveman Argentine way. And what's the Argentine caveman way? Because in reality, I'm so scared, I'm going to create a bunch of regulations so nobody can go out on the street. Obviously, it's stupid, and it's what's been done in Argentina systematically. In the meantime, the labor modernization implies leaving that Precambrian system. And if I need to assure myself, go get an insurance policy not making it tough on all Argentinians just so I feel more secure. And that's aberrant. It goes against private property rights and liberty. Which part is so hard to understand? What this does at first, look, I'm letting you know, there's big business in this because today in the formal labor market, there's 6 million people pinned since the year 2011. And in the informal labor market, there are 8 million. On the sidelines are all those disguised as public employees or social monotributes. This means that at first, there is an enormous opportunity to begin insurance market with 8 million new people. And will surely, at least two actors will realize the opportunity there. And what that will do, it will make the price signal clean. And if we complement that with lowering the penalties on judgments, the situation of the labor market is very important. And why is this too important? Because it has to do with a second generation reform, which is the retirement system. Because if we take the formal labor market of 6 million to 14 million, in addition, there's going to be strong economic growth due to the reforms we're going to be implementing. And in addition, there's an increase in productivity and an increase in wages, plus the benefits of the monetary stability. This means that in addition, given the increase in wages, we're going to have to 
also have an increase in the PEA. And all of these are the key value drivers of the retirement system, motive for which in the second generation reforms, it will be possible to reform the retirement system without taking away rights. What rocks are they going to have? What rocks are they going to throw? If no one's losing and everyone's winning. What happens is to avoid the rocks, you have to use your brain and less cheap slogans. So that has to do with the labor market. Once we become competitive in the fiscal realms, once we're competitive in the labor markets, Argentina will be in a position to be competitive and will be able to open up unilaterally to the world and have and enjoy the benefits of international commerce. And also, we have an international political strategy as well. Our international politics, except for some repairs, that I am willing to listen to, we are defenders of peace, defenders of free commerce. We are defenders of democracy and above all, defenders of freedom. And that implicates a clear geopolitical alignment. Our geopolitical alignment is United States and Israel. That is our international politics. We will not align with communists. And in difference from the lies that they try to establish from Juntos por el Cambio and the mainstream media that responds to their funding, That doesn't mean that the private sector can't commercialize with whomever they want. One thing is the geopolitics, which is a function of the government, and yes, and we have a clear alignment. Commerce should be free, and the private sector should be able to commercialize with whomever they want. What happens is that this difference the collectivists don't understand. They think they have to be sticking their hands over everything and controlling it. So they say, no, how are we going to stop commercializing with Brazil? How are we going to stop commercializing with China? I didn't say we don't have to commercialize with China nor with Brazil. What I'm saying is that's the private sector's business and I shouldn't be involved in it. Be careful with because many of the focus groups tell them they have to disguise themselves as liberals, but when you scratch them a little bit, the interventionism and communism comes out from everywhere. Once we've completed this group of reforms in reality, according to our studies, this will allow 15 years of strong growth for Argentina. So you will see businesses to do everywhere. Come on, gentlemen. It's time to take advantage. The one that gets in first always makes more. But obviously, this is not all. If there's anything that has been clear throughout the different phases of the campaign that we've been doing, is what has to do with our proposal in the monetary system. And that looks for eventually closing the central bank. There have been in different places, different criticisms. And we have four arguments why we must dollarize. The first is a moral argument. The question is, does anyone in this conference hall think that stealing is okay? 
Does someone consider that stealing is good? So then why are we going to allow the government to steal $25 billion a year through seniorage? Why do we have to allow the government to steal $25 billion through seniorage? What's more, you can't be such a delinquent and say that this goes against the sovereignty of our country and gives power to the imperial. What's the difference if you're going to get robbed between the one that's going to steal a lot and that's going to steal a little, you're going to want the one that steals a little. So it's the same. The interesting part is that the individuals are going to pick because there's going to be monetary competition. You decide who you want to rob from you more or less. This means that you're going to be able to use whatever money you want. So let's say if you're into oil, for example, you can make your contracts in WTI or if you're in gas in BTU. If you're in soy, you can do it with the price of soy in Chicago. What's more, those economists, hard-headed, very hard-headed. I mean with intellectual blinders on, they say the inflexibility of the prices in the bank. And my question is, are you businessmen or don't you know the futures market? Don't you know about the options market and how to cover yourselves from those risks? How are you going to tolerate these sketchy economists telling you what you can do and can't do? I don't need you to protect me. I don't need you to take care of me. I need you to t get out of my way. What's more, if you're worried about the rigidity of the labor market, you fix it with labor legislation. In other words, if I have a labor market that's inflexible, I have to correct the inflexibility. I don't correct it with monetary politics. Because then I fix the labor market with monetary politics. Then I correct the prices the same way. Then the shock, external shocks. Then distribution of income. Then the fiscal deficit. And that's why we've taken 13 zeros off of our money and we're looking to take three more off. Two hyperinflations without war in Argentina is a disaster. And the argument is about technical. You can have a great product, but if that product, nobody wants it, the price is zero. Nobody wants pesos. Everybody, and with motives, more than enough motives, they hate the money that politicians emit in Argentina. Therefore, so the value of the balance of real equilibrium is zero, unless you're in favor of the violence. Monetary violence is called forced course. But if we gave them liberty, nobody would want to have the pesos. That means that if I insist on putting a certain amount of money, the counter face of that is going to be endlessly high prices. In other words, very high inf inflation rates. Hello, here we are. And besides, look, do you think it's right that someone can do one thing freely and one person can do the same thing and go to jail? Have you ever thought of printing your own bills? Money? Nobody? Why don't you think you don't do it? Because you'd go to jail. It's a falsification. So why is that okay for the government to do? And why is it illegal if we do it? Gentlemen, rip up your bills. Get out of that mental slavery. Don't let yourself be scammed by a bunch of delinquents called politicians. Be free. Be free. Don't get scammed. Because they're the same ones that are always sticking their hands in your pocket. The same ones that are make this country a misery. A shame. I propose we get on our feet, be free, and be great again. 
in that sense, there are other proposals. There are another four technical proposals for the dollarization. And if there's a new one, we're going to study that one too. There are some that I like more, some that I like less. But my compromise and Victoria's and the Liberty advances, we are going to end the inflation and the insecurity. And by the way, it's going to be the first time in history that a vice president is going to be in charge of two ministries, which are the Ministry of Defense and, Def and Security, to add more novelty to our government. And of those alternatives, we have a commitment and a mandate to end with inflation. And we're going to try however we can. We're going to do all that we can within our power. Our best option is eliminating the central bank. There's also a theoretical discussion with the economists with cobwebs in their head, but that's not a discussion for here. But what I want to say, if through all the institutional channels that we are going to try, finish with the central bank in order to finish with inflation forever. And then even with that, if we couldn't do it, then we're going to overreact with our fiscal adjustment. We're going to impulse more primary fiscal results. More financial fiscal results for what? To take more money off of the streets. Our commitment with ending inflation is not negotiable. And if the politics, because they want to continue stealing, don't let us pass those reforms, we will overreact the fiscal adjustment so it hurts even more to the politicians. As a matter of fact, why wouldn't the politicians let this pass? And it's exactly because of this. They don't let it pass because they benefit from this. They steal five to six points of GDP each year, 25 to $30 billion a year each year. Obviously, obviously they pay for an army of hitmen, thieves, and delinquents that say it can't be done. Well, I didn't come to cry and say, oh, it can't be done. I'm sure in 1860, when they started applying Alberti's constitution, I'm sure they said, you can't do that. Or those that liberated the slaves in 1813, and nowhere in the world do they do that. We are convinced. The important is, not only do we know what we have to do, we know how to do it. And above all, we have the conviction that we get out of this with more liberty, not with less. And if we embrace the ideas of liberty, don't have any doubt that within 35 to 50 years, Argentina will be on its feet and will be a, a world potential. Thank you very much. Integra Capital, Integra Lithium, Minera Aguilar, Newmont Corporation, operadora de la mina Cerro Negro en Santa Cruz, Pan American Energy, Panedile, Pfizer Incorporated, con el apoyo de CAF, Banco de Desarrollo de...